Hello and uh, good evening. Welcome to our first Insight into event of the uh, academic year. It's lovely to have you all here with us tonight for our Insight into Engineering talk. Um, I'm uh, Mrs Norton, Sarah Norton, Head of um, Sick Form and Careers here at Manchester High School for Girls. And we have with us tonight uh, three um, alumni from the school. Um, speaking first will be um, Ebony Stevenson, who left in 2017 um, and who has followed a largely mechanical engineering path. Um, we'll then be hearing from Holly Smith, who is class of 2013, um, who is involved in civil engineering. And our final speaker of the evening is going to be Yvonne uh, Barton, who was class of 75. Um, and she has had a very varied career and her area is of chemical engineering, but of course, a lot more involved in it than that. At the end of the speakers, um, I'll be rounding up with a few ideas about how you can get into studying engineering. And then there will also be an opportunity for questions. So as our speakers are speaking, if you would like to post questions in the um, question box that should appear at the side of your screen, at the end of the speakers, I'll be able to um, ask them some of those questions and, and post the answers where, where appropriate there. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our very first speaker and uh, a, wish a very warm welcome to um, Ebony. Over to you, Ebony, and welcome. Thank you very much. Hi there. Um, it's really great to be here, actually. I'm super excited to be able to share about my experience. Um, as I want to say Sarah, but it feels really strange because she was my old teacher. So every part of me wants to say Mrs Norton, but as um, Sarah has just said, um, yes, graduated in two, well, finished school in 2017, um, started at Manhattan in 2010. I had a really great experience there. So yeah, I'm just here to tell you a little bit about my journey into engineering, how I got into it and how I've experienced it so far. There's me looking all engineering -y with a high vis jacket and a hard hat on. Um, and this was during a placement that I did within my degree. So I'll, I'll get onto that later on. So this is me at school and um, I think this was the final day of sixth form where we could come back in in our school uniform um, and <laughs> mum took this picture of me in the living room was like I need to, need to get this picture um, and she's probably watching actually so hi mum. Uh, whilst I was at school I had a lot of interests really I was into everything I was just so excited by the opportunity to be at the school and I have to take the opportunity to really thank my parents for um, the sacrifices that they made and really um, helping me along during my school years. I had a great time um, and I was able to also be head girl at the time, which was really a privilege, a massive privilege. So all this to say that really, whilst I was at school, especially at the start, I didn't have the slightest idea that I'd end up doing engineering. I just enjoyed everything um, I wasn't the best at everything. I mean, like I've got the school play on there and <laughs> I, you know, used to be like customer number two or whatever, or just operate the lighting, but I just wanted to try everything. And I was first introduced to engineering in, I think it would have been year 10 by uh, my physics teacher, who is the late Dr. Leach, who was really, really a great inspiration to me um, and to a lot of students here. So also want to pay my respects to him um, for having you know believed in me and show me this this great world of engineering really so within that scheme a few of us were picked and we formed a group and we were we were partnered with an organization or a company and um, in our case it was a laser manufacturer which was really cool because lasers exciting um, and together as a group, we came up with a problem that we wanted to solve. So I think from what I remember, we decided to look at how these lasers were mounted. Um, because I think it was to do with the production line and how they were manufacture, manufactured. It was quite an um, intricate piece of um, hardware to design. So we, we had the opportunity to go away, write a report, do some um, drawings and then construct something. We built it as a team and that was really great for me to learn about 
teamwork and all the different facets to engineering so yes there's the maths yes there's the you know building things but there's also writing reports teamwork um planning loads of gantt charts and all that so that was that was my first sort of insight into engineering if you like and then at school these were the subjects that i took so in gcse i chose to do triple science history spanish german statistics and further maths and then at a level i took five as's and four a levels um i wouldn't I'm not going to discourage anyone from doing that because if that's what you want to do, then definitely. But I probably, um, I think doing five is, is quite a bit. But I, uh, I did really enjoy those. And I think the most important A-levels there um, in terms of engineering is definitely in maths and physics. I know some degrees, um, they don't mind so much about the physics, but maths is definitely integral. So that was that was my school years. So then going on to uni, I went to the University of Bristol to study engineering design. That was the, the title of my course. So I've just got an overview. I'm not expecting you to be able to read all of that because I've done the text really small, but I'm going to delve into each of those years. So my time at Bristol was really fantastic. I've only just finished this year and um, I, I really enjoyed the city. It's a really lovely city. I think if I hadn't have seen this course, I never would have ended up in Bristol, which is where I am now at the moment, because it's just so far away from Manchester. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about uni. If you decide to go away, you get to see a brand new city um, and experience of independence as well. So I know quite a lot of people from Manhai tend to go to Bristol um, because it's, I'm not sure why, but um, it's definitely a great place. And I had um, friends there from Manhai that came along with me, which was nice, but also made lots of new friends. So going into the first year of the course, this is just to give an overview of the type of uh, content that really is within most engineering courses. So you'll have a lot of maths based um subjects uh physics and for me in my degree um having done further maths a level was really advantageous because it meant that when i came to this stage doing engineering mathematics a lot of the stuff that was taught to us i did recognize it so if you haven't done further maths it's not the end of the world because they do teach it to you but I think with the way that I learn, I was glad that I've already covered it already because I think it might have made me a bit <laughs> nervous seeing all of that for the first time. So thankfully it was like a reintroduction. But this is generally like a mechanical sort of degree. So within the first year, it was general. And then in the second year, we could choose to specialise in either civil, mechanical or aerospace. So um, I think probably a lot of these might differ for Holly and Yvonne, but in terms of mechanical and uh, aerospace and some civil, these are sort of the general sort of um, modules that will occur at most first year engineering degrees. Sorry, I've made a transition slide so you can have to press it twice every time. Um, yes, yeah, so second year, was a lot less content but probably the busiest one because this is everyone will say this is the year where it starts to count so in first year you do get a chance to you know you just have to pass because they, they're aware of everything else that you're dealing with moving away from home learning how to look after yourself and all that so second year is really when your grades start counting towards your final your final grade um, and this year was was lots of fun. We started a design project. So a lot of what I did in my degree was group work, group projects, and that became quite important. And it's it's reflective of how it will be in the industry. Like you hardly ever work on your own. Um, and it's a lot better to work with other people, I think, because you've got diverse ideas and you have to learn how to, you know, put your ideas forward 
if you're someone who's more reserved and then you also have to learn sometimes like okay I had this idea but the majority don't want it so we'll let that one slide so there's there's a lot of good skills in that um yes I think for this year we we built a robot um, a little agribot to water a field and then we also uh, designed solar lighting for refugee camps so that was that was a lot of fun so my third year I spent in industry so this in my degree this was built into the course and it was sort of like an opt out so everyone most people decided to do this year in industry because that was how the course was um sort of sold to us and for me it was such a great opportunity because I think even at this stage I wasn't entirely sure what an engineer had <laughs> what an engineer does having done two years at uni I was like okay there's some maths there's some physics but what what do I actually do on a you know a nine to five basis so for us we had a list of companies that we could um, interview for and then they matched us up so I was at Hawley which is a building services consultancy and I'd never heard anything about building services before until I got there and the best way I can describe it someone used this metaphor and ever since I think it's the best the best way I've heard to describe building services so if a building were a person the skin would be the architecture, you know, the aesthetics, and then the bones would be like the structural or maybe civil engineer. And then the internal organs and the veins, that would be the building services. So how it's ventilated, how it's heated, um, how to get rid of waste, wastewater, human waste and all that. And it has a lot to do with how to make buildings sustainable as well because the construction industry is massively you know historically not very sustainable so there's a lot of um, work being put into making construction a lot more sustainable how can we use less material and um, how can we you know instead of just knocking a building down how can we use the existing building and then build within it and reduce embodied carbon when we're building and using uh, sustainable and renewable energy and that sort of thing so while some placement i've got i know i've got a lot of random pictures dotted about but <laughs> these are some snapshots of um some of the work that i conducted so i i made sure that whilst i was there i got my toes in as many different areas as i could so that i could get a, a broad picture so i did a little bit of electrical engineering mostly mechanical sustainability digital modeling and this was a really useful year in terms of learning how to keep professional records so you'll probably hear later from holly about the chartership process but you've got to be on top of keeping records of what you've done so this was a good early introduction to that And then in my fourth year, this was the chance we had to start picking our own modules and making it more specialised to what we wanted to study. So the orange ones are what I had chosen. Um, I was quite interested in more of the civil units, um, but I, I didn't really get to that stage until year five. So here you can see um, further computer programming, which was good, I think programming is a good skill to have as an engineer it's not necessary though because I wouldn't say it was my my strong suit at all but if you can you know get a bit of experience with that that's that's a good thing to, to be able to do um yeah yeah I think that's that's mostly all I want to say on that one and then fifth year this is where more of the civil sort of units start showing their head and I thought to myself oh maybe I should have done civil instead but um <laughs> I had a great I had a great mix I think I think coming from a mechanical angle at civil issues was really what suited me so um I got to learn about wind and marine power design that was really interesting um disaster resilience and sustainable development that was a, a really great module as well smart cities that's going to be the future and energy management was 
was really quite important because everything that we're going to be doing as engineers is about conserving energy and you have to have if you're going to be a good engineer you have to have a good understanding of um conserving energy really because we know about the climate crisis like i don't have to explain what's going on and that's it's quite at the forefront you'll find in a lot of your modules if you go to uni there'll be a lot of emphasis on on sustainable design as well and then the last one innovation entrepreneurship and enterprise i enjoyed that because i wanted to have some idea about um enterprise if i wanted to start a business or a lot of engineering students will do um create a startup um of an idea that they have it's quite common and there's no reason why why anyone could not start their own business um i'm sure there's loads of brilliant ideas that you all have and i thought this was a really good module just to learn about the process of doing that and generating ideas and such so yes uh, the design project this was something that carried on from year four and that was a group project as well and that was sort of equivalent to our masters and we did that um we were partnered with a company in bristol called bright green futures and they build um sustainable housing developments they made they make a sort of community so we looked at their process and how they design these houses but we actually found out that the thing that needed the most help was not necessarily the design process but more the how they manage um the procurement of their clients and managing that information and the decisions that they make so we decided to make an app where all of uh, the information of a client within this community was stored and we we played around with how they could change different settings about their house so almost like design the house within this app and see how much energy they might use if they you know had triple glazing rather than double glazing and how much energy they might save if they use air source heat pump so that was that was good fun So typical day at work, what is it actually like? So currently I'm on my third week at work and I'm working at Hawley, which is where I did my placement. Um, and yeah, I think this is a good question because I really would, would have wanted to know this <laughs> loads of years ago when I was watching something like this. So I cycle in and you've got general admin project work. So the next slide talks about what project work might entail. So as an example, um, I'm currently on this project where we have a sort of specialist building. The building currently is a little bit knackered and it used to be used as a like a printing um, printing station for uh, the newspaper, the local newspaper. And now it's being converted into offices, but also with labs inside. So it's a bit of a specialist design because you need to make sure that the airflow is enough for when, you know, like at school, the the labs in the chemistry um, department, they need special sort of ventilation. Otherwise, you know, you don't want the chemicals just being in the room. So it's designing for offices, but also labs in the same space. So on a project, um, we might start off with a design team meeting. So the next, yeah, we might start off with a design team meeting and that would include an architect, structural engineer and MEP engineer. So MEP is just standing for mechanical, electrical, plumbing. Those are the building services engineers. So we would come together, talk about the budget, what the, what the architect wants, how they want it to look, what does the client want, um, what is the structural engineer's initial ideas? In this project, the client has really ambitious sustainability targets. So that would be like the focus of our meeting. How would we, what do we think we need to do to achieve this? Then going away from that meeting, me as um, a mechanical engineer would start doing some initial calculation and sizing. So that's just um, saying, okay, if we've got this many rooms and we think this many people will be in there doing this and this i think we might need this amount of air so therefore we might need a duct that's this big 
Um, how much space do we have in the room? Can it fit in the ceiling? Um, where can we make compromises based on, you know, how the architect wants the room to look? Or if there's a beam there, can we move around it? And just initial ideas. And then once I've constructed those, I will put it into some sort of model and then we will coordinate together. So obviously I can't have a pipe running through someone's electrical cable and uh, I can't, you know, destroy the architect's pretty facade. So we would coordinate our designs and make sure that they fit within the space that, that, they, that we have. And if it doesn't fit, then we can always go back and um, say, oh, we need more space or we need more time or maybe we need more money. And then once that's been coordinated, we would model the design in um, digital software and issue that to the client for that stage. So that's that's a project that will probably take, um, you know, that would be over the course of a maybe two months. So a typical day would be attending to any of these things and any of the steps in between, if that makes sense. But, um, you know, it's not all just sitting at a desk. There's fun and there's other graduates, other people there that you can talk to. There's often social events and I found a really strange connection between engineers and rock climbing. They seem to love rock climbing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Holly's nodding her head. I don't know what's what's going on there, but you probably will end up rock climbing or cycling. That seems to be the two main <laughs> the two main things. Um, yes, so that's about a day at work. So my top tips would be First of all, anyone can do maths. I think we might have this idea in general that it's got to be a certain type of person to be an engineer. I have to be like extremely the maths whiz. I mean, I took a lot of maths at school, but that was just because I liked it. I wouldn't say I had a natural knack for maths. Actually, I quite was into writing and, and like English. But I just thought, oh, this is interesting. I want to learn more. So it's more about working hard. Um, anyone can do it. So don't think oh, I'm not like a mathsy person, so I can't do engineering. Like I don't believe there's such thing as a mathsy person, in my opinion. As long as you like it, then you can do it. Um, I would say also get as much work experience as you can. So I know I appreciate this can be quite difficult during school, but um, I know there's a lot of schemes out there that want to take students whilst they're still at school. Um, and definitely whilst you're at uni, if you've got the opportunity to do an industrial placement for a year, that's good. Or finding a summer placement, that's a good thing to do as well. If you don't want to take a year out, a summer placement is a great thing to do because that's how essentially I've ended up in my job. I've just made connections and kept them. Um, I'd also say acquire a mentor. I had a mentor from Manhai, Kelly Morgan, and she's she's brilliant. Um, I think it's great to have someone to look up to, ask questions, and I know we've got a mentorship scheme here, so if you can get yourself a mentor, that's great. Um, I'd say take every opportunity to pursue your interests, so not just restricted to engineering. Don't think, oh, I know, I need to make sure that all of my interests are like coding or like math. You can do whatever if you love music or if you love writing. I really loved poetry at school. Um, it's not restrictive. You can be an engineer with all these facets as well. It's all included in who you are. And then I'd say definitely take leadership opportunities when they come and or actively look for them. You don't have to be the kind of person that's, you know, first to put the hand up or always the loudest, but leadership does come in lots of different forms and um, leadership qualities is really important as an engineer as well as teamwork. So if it means, you know, volunteering yourself, maybe I'll lead this project or I'll I'll do this, then it's a, it's a good way to put yourself forward. So those are my top tips. And that's me done. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much, um, Ebony. That was fascinating. And um, it was very nice for you to mention Dr. Leach, so thank you for that, he'll be very proud of you. Um, to know that you've gone on to use all the excellent work that you've done at school yourself 
in your degree and uh, now your career. Um, so that was a really fascinating and interesting and engaging presentation, especially because you're relatively new to this. You are just coming out of your education and practical work placements, which of course have led you to your first job, which is really, really exciting on your, you know, the, the start of your what is bound to be an excellent career. So some really nice tips there about school, um, you know, do the things that you enjoy, do the things that bring you pleasure as well as can help towards you deciding what, what degree and what, what you want to study and what career you might want to go into. We do have a mentoring scheme, which we'll be um, announcing and launching quite soon um, mm -hmm. this term for, for Man High students in year 12, the Project Pankhurst. And it is an, an excellent scheme where um, alumni can mentor present students. Um, so that's something that, that if you're a current year 12 student or indeed a younger student at the school, you'll be hearing about in the future. Um, and also about the maths as well. So there is a lot um, of maths in engineering, but if you've not done further maths, that's fine. You'll, you'll pick up the maths and be taught and learn the maths as you enter into the degree. So it's not to be put off if that's not your huge strength, equally coding, um, but it's, you know, if you can even just do some of those things in your own time, maybe a little bit of interest if you're doing MOOCs or something like that, these online courses in preparation, for university applications, might be something you just want to look at. So there are lots of opportunities and things that you can do. Um, so thank you uh, so much for that, um, Ebony. And as I say, if there are any questions that people want, if you want to just post those questions, you can come back at the end and I can address them to um, the speakers. So I'm now going to move on to our next uh, speaker. So thank you again, um, Ebony. Um, move on to our next speaker, um, um, Holly. And she's going to be talking about her career to date and her time at school and um, no doubt give you some excellent advice as well. So welcome Holly and I'm now going to hand over to Holly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening everyone. My name is Holly Smith. I'm an agent and a chartered civil engineer from Skanska. Um, and really excited to share with you a little bit about sort of my early career so far in civil engineering. So next slide please. And again. So I thought just to start out, it's probably pretty important just to know what civil engineers do. It's not something you're potentially that exposed to at school. Um, so I think civil engineering put really simply is civil engineers basically design, construct and maintain infrastructure. Um, and that can be a whole wide variety of different things is a very, very broad discipline. Um, so you're only going to get a slight insight into what I do tonight, but um, just so you get a bit of a breath, I just thought I'd go through a few of the things civil engineers might work on first. So if you go to the next slide, please. So one of the key things people think of, I think, with civil engineers, the civil engineers geek out over bridges. That's definitely true. And I put this photo up because this one is uh, the Millennium Bridge in London, and that was actually a civil engineering failure. Um, so this uh, bridge, um, the civil engineers, I suppose, didn't design properly at the time, and um, it's, it was known as the Wobbly Bridge in London. So the the sort of momentum of having uh, pedestrians on the bridge caused the bridge to wobble. So they actually had to do some strengthening work to that bridge, sort of post it being constructed. So um, I guess one lesson there is people still make mistakes in their professional lives. Um, next slide, please. Uh, railways. So I think this this is one probably quite close to a lot of people's heart because people find it really annoying. Um, so civil engineers are often those people when there's engineering works on the line at night time or when you want to go somewhere on a bank holiday. Um, we're often out there maintaining the lines or building new lines um, and it is very, very hard work. Um, Rail is definitely a sector I've been quite heavily involved in, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it is also really, really exciting because you have such tight time pressures to be able to deliver uh, work in. So that's rail. Uh, next slide, please. I think stations or maybe even buildings. So I'm heavily involved in the infrastructure sector, so um, I don't do a lot of building work, but stations are probably as close as I would get to a building as, as we go. Um, and I guess as well, probably another topic that people might be slightly interested in, and I'll pick up on this point now, is what's the difference between a civil engineer and an architect? Um, we 
I'd probably describe us like probably siblings who kind of hate each other, but also have a mutual respect for each other. Um, so architects awfully, often are sort of our creative, um, our creative friends who come up with these wonderful ideas like the roof here at King's Cross Station and we'll sketch it out and come to the ex civil or structural engineer they're kind of one of the same and say can you make this work and often it gives us a real headache but we'll give it a real good go um, so that's the main difference there um, I'd say architects will have an appreciation of how buildings work and what forces and loads can be transferred but often when they go to something more crazy and complex like this they need the expertise of a civil or structural engineer uh, next slide please Stadiums is another quite interesting one, not one you maybe get to work on every day just because they're not something that's built all of the time. Um, but particularly, I think from a from a stadium's point of view, um, it's quite, a, again, a complex piece of infrastructure just because of the size. And particularly if you're having roofs on these kind of structures, it's, it's hardly, it's very, very difficult to, um, to build these kind of things. Um, next slide. Buildings, they're everywhere, we all need them um, and every building is different. So a lot of my friends who work in civil engineering do work in the building sector in London um, and you could be doing anything from sort of high rise buildings like the Shard, which you can see there, to something much more low rise or kind of as sort of Ebony touched on with the climate crisis, actually doing much more retrofitting of existing buildings um, to make sure that we can use them going forward and also sort of meet some of our climate change goals. Uh, next slide, please. Highways, again, it's not an area I've massively worked on, um, but my company do a lot of highways. Um, what can be quite typical is you tend to specialise maybe in one particular field of infrastructure that you're interested in. Um, I think highways, again, is really, really challenging and it can kind of, I, I'd say as a civil engineer, it's something maybe if you're a bit more of a generalist, generalist people go in because it might have aspects of buildings, um, major earthwork, drainage, um, road construction. So I think highways kind of usually encompasses a bit of everything. Um, definitely something I'm interested in doing at some point in the future. Um, next slide, please. Airports again. I've not done much of an air, much work on airports, but again, civil engineers and engineers in general can be involved anywhere from sort of the really initial design phase all the way through to construction and maintenance. Um, the picture I think here, I believe, is of Heathrow, the potential Heathrow extension, which I did do some initial sort of design work on. Um, very controversial project. Um, but it's really interesting sort of the relationship between civil engineering, infrastructure and politics as well. So that's something I've found quite interesting about the career, which is very, maybe you wouldn't expect. It's not massy. It's not, you know, it's really about sort of delivering the needs for society and you know, stimulating economic growth as well. Next slide, please. And this is my sort of... Uh, I guess pet passion but I love tunnels I find tunnels so fascinating um, it's a very specialist in uh, industry and it is quite London based and focused at the moment so I work in London um, and I've just been involved in the starting of tunneling work into London for high speed too so I'll touch on that a little bit as well uh, next slide please so now you know a little bit about civil engineering, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about my path there. Um, I know Ebony um, talked quite a lot about university, so I'll probably just um, breeze through that a little bit. But so at school, I actually did very, very similar. So I, I joined Manchester High actually at sixth form, but for GCSEs, I did triple science. Um, I think I did some additional maths as well, Spanish and geography, so quite broad, but my passion was always in sort of science and math and that's one of the reasons I moved to Manchester High so I actually did exactly the same subjects as Ebony which is quite interesting so did the maths for the maths chemistry and physics um, it was really challenging but I think there was a really good core group of us there who were, who were all kind of pursuing those subjects and we could help ourselves through some of those challenging times 
Um, I also did the engineering education scheme, which was sort of what inspired me into engineering. I really liked them as pure subjects, but for me, I, I'm much more a practical person. I wanted a career where I'd be applying those subjects and engineering just fit perfectly for me. Um, so I sort of knew straight away from that, that I wanted to do civil engineering. Um, not really sure why thinking back at it, but it was just the one that screamed out to me. Um, so I did my civil engineering degree at University of Bristol as well. Um, can't can't um, knock Bristol at all. It's a fantastic university, great city, had a great time there. All, loads of my friends still live in Bristol as well. So would re highly recommend it as a university, um, whether you're going into engineering or not. Um, while I was there, I was really fortunate to have be sponsored through the Institution of Civil Engineers. So every year they give undergraduate scholarships out um, where they give you a bit of money every year towards your university fees and you have summer placements um, where you're partnered with a company so you can get some on-site experience while you're in your summers. Um, so the photo of me there as sort of a little baby site engineer was on Crossrail in London. Um, so that was building sort of the tunnels and platforms for Crossrail, which is finally open now. So that that's uh, that was a fantastic experience and really convinced me. Like again, Sam, like Emily said, like in university, it can all be very theoretical, and when you can actually transfer what you've used at university into the field, it's really really satisfying. Um, so yeah, I think there's sort of roughly my journey, so you can sort of see the progression from a. Uh, jumping outside Manchester High to being in the tunnels of London and graduating at Bristol. So I've now been working for Skanska, who are a major UK construction company and sort of globally as well um, for five years. And I've recently become a chartered civil engineer as well, which was a massive, massive challenge, but um, really satisfying to achieve that. Um, next slide, please. So just touching on civil engineering as a career and different routes in quickly. Um, so I went through the university route. Um, you could either do a bachelor's in engineering, which is a three year course or an integrated master's, which is a four year course. Um, typically, most people will apply to do an integrated master's because that makes the route to chartership easier, which is getting a professional qualification. Um, but it's not it's not a barrier either. There's just other ways you would other sort of things you'd have to do to get there. Um, so doing a bachelor's, if that's what you want to do, isn't isn't a limiter. You just have to make up for not doing that next year in other ways. Um, although what I'd really like to, I suppose, shout out is the opportunities through apprenticeships. So um, at the moment, I think particularly in the construction sector, apprenticeships are becoming really, really big. In fact, I know for Skanska we're hiring more apprentices now than graduates just because that's the they seem to find that they're much more practical in the knowledge they have. Um, so and that benefits you as well because you get university for free and you're not in debt for ages. So I definitely say that apprenticeships are well, well worth looking into. Um, so it might be that you're on a day release, so you do one day at university a week, four days on the job. The degree will take longer, but often they're also linked to those professional qualifications as well. So, for example, I think you can kind of do an integrated apprenticeship masters and that might take about eight years. But as a part built into that, you'll also work towards being chartered. So you kind of get to the end result at the same time. It's just I did my four years of uni and then I've done four years of work and then I've become chartered. So it depends on sort of how you learn and you know, the sacrifices to not having the university experience as well. But um, I think as well at the moment with the university being so expensive and, you know, I think people are quite itching to not be in loads of debt and earn money straight away out of out of, university, out of school even. So it's definitely an option to keep in mind. Um, I'd say engineering, probably all of the disciplines of engineering provide really um, sort of I don't know, steady careers, I suppose that there's something you're always going to need an engineer. There's not really any downtimes. Um, so I think it's it's a career where you can you can kind of count on income always coming in and the income earning potential is quite high as well. Um, so I think that's always a good thing to to know that if you're going to commit to sort of a four four year degree that eventually uh, the outcome will be quite good. 
Um, next slide, please. So I just thought I thought I'd kind of touch on a bit more about my career because I think um, you've got like a variety of three different speakers tonight and I've sort of just completed the early stages of my career. So I've done about five years now and I've worked on a variety of different projects in that time. Um, so all of them have been quite high speed two related um, because that's I guess it's Europe's biggest infrastructure project at the moment. So it's hu using huge amount of resources. Um, but um, I've worked on a big water main replacement, which you can kind of see in the bottom photo. Um, so that was sort of uh, diverting water supply through Camden and London to make room for the railway. So that was something I never thought I'd be involved in, but was quite an interesting and challenging project. Um, I then went on to do kind of ground investigation work where I was looking at the different soils that the tunneling machines would be moving through and basically confirming that a lot of the assumed ground conditions by the designers were correct. Um, I then went away for nine months to work for a design company. So I left my oranges for a little bit um, and I did some work sort of designing tunnels. So that was just a completely different lifestyle for me um, compared to working on a construction site, being in an office environment. Um, so that was a really good experience that the company supported me through as well. And then sort of since then I've had moved back to HS2 again and then been working on a combination of sort of bridge, bridge construction and um, basically setting up for tunnelling work into London. Um, also, I think another sort of point to just touch on is every engineering discipline has sort of a, an institution. So um, I'm quite an active part of the Institution of Civil Engineers. They're kind of your professional body who you might become chartered through. And they gave me some amazing opportunities. So they have a program called Future Leaders, which I think is quite, they probably have similar in um, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers or Electrical Engineers, for example. But um, that was basically an opportunity where I was able to engage with government about sort of infrastructure decisions, which was quite mad, really. Um, but um, that's an amazing opportunity. Um, big promotion for women in engineering. So I was lucky to win the top 50 women in engineering in 2020 for doing work in sort of the sustainability space. And yeah, just getting involved with sort of higher level projects sort of outside of work. I was really interested in how the decisions we make as civil engineers or engineers in general affect climate. Um, was pretty shocked to find out that 60% um, of the carbon we produce in the UK is down to our infrastructure. Um, so we as engineers have a huge part to play in uh, producing that number and actually being able to sort of meet the aims of our, our commitments to climate. Um, those kind of decisions I might make every day at work are much more than me, I don't know, recycling at home, for example. So it's just that scale of the impact you can have. Also, if you're lucky, you might get to inspect a sewer, which is, you know, the highlight of any civil engineer's career. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on sort of the most recent project I've been working on, um, mainly because if you probably go into any engineering field, there's a good chance you might get the opportunity to work on high speed too. Um, obviously, again, a hugely controversial project. Um, but it is employing a huge number of people in this country and as sort of a young professional who's come through, I think the, the, the development opportunities they're providing as a company for apprentices and graduates to learn, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty unrivaled, to be honest, in terms of the ambition the projects have in terms of being really innovative from an engineering point of view and just extremely challenging. Um, so. For those who don't know about High Speed 2, it's a new rail line that will run initially from London to Birmingham um, and it will drastically increase our rail capacity on the UK sort of network. At the moment, we're completely gridlocked on uh, the railway system. So it's vital we give ourselves more resilience for to basically get passenger trains off the existing network. Passengers will go on to High Speed 2 and we'll free up more room for freight on the existing lines, which then has the in turn climate benefits of getting sort of freight off the roads. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of the part I've been working on is the London section. So we're tunneling through seven different boroughs of London 
which is an absolute nightmare if you consider how much underground infrastructure is already in London, including the tubes, trains, utilities, people with basements and all that kind of malarkey. So it's quite hectic. Um, and there's a huge amount of bridge structures that are being built kind of further north on the route as well. Um, so I think it's an, it is an amazing project in terms of the scale. And we're really lucky to have that in this country at this kind of time. Um, next slide, please. Um, the bit I've been working on at the moment is starting to launch uh, the two tunnel boring machines into London, and they are absolutely massive pieces of kit. I never thought I'd be sort of someone to be working on this, but just to give a sense of scale before I sort of talk about what I've done on that project is um, how big is a TBM? This one we've just launched is 9.1 metres in diameter. So I think if, if you click the next slide, just to give a sense of scale, it's about two London buses tall. It's very large and I can guarantee you the people in the photo as well as pretty much an exclusive German engineering team and they are quite tall men as it is. <laughs> so um, it's not small. And then next slide, please. And then how, how long is a TBM? So I think if you just click again, um, they a lot of people only can sit kind of think the the cool bit of a tunnel boring machine is the cutter head at the front. Um, but it's actually about 10 London buses long, so nearly 100 metres worth of, again, kind of mechanical, electrical. I mean, it's, it almost works pretty robotically and automatically. Kit just which drives itself forward. So it's one of the coolest things I've definitely ever been involved with. Um, so next slide, please. So these are just some of the sort of my highlights over the last year. So I've I've been responsible for all the site setup for the tunneling work. Um, so the first picture you can see in the top left is a storage yard for all the tunneling segments. So tunneling is a 24 hour process at seven days a week. So we have to make sure that the tunnel machine is consistently provided with segments. Um, so my responsibility in this Kind of hard to imagine this was a golf course when we arrived. Um, so basically my responsibility, we had to build up an embankment to get the segments at the right level for the tunneling machine, then put concrete slabs down for basically uh, to run sort of vehicles up and down. We then had to put in large concrete foundations to put this crane up, which then automatically kind of picks up the segments and puts them down for transfer into the tunnel. Um, another quite interesting bit of work I worked on was in the bottom right hand corner um, and this was a bit of sheet piling for a bridge construction. Um, that's kind of all technical, that's not really what I wanted to talk about. The bit I did want to talk about is just highlight kind of the impact that engineers have to kind of work around the local community. So we had such a lot of responsibility when doing this work because we're right next to a live train line which you can see on the left. We had a public right of way on the right, so people were walking past us all the time. We had a local river we had to protect. It was a very, very challenging piece of work. And I think for me, that's what I really enjoy. I love having sort of the heart of my knowledge, which is engineering, but being able to use it to deliver something without impacting, or well, trying to impact people as little as possible and the environment and, you know, other major, major stakeholders. Um, so that, that was a really challenging piece of work. And then sort of the top right hand photo and the bottom left hand photo was um, me and some of my colleagues really. So one of the biggest challenges I've had, I think, by working as a woman, particularly in the construction sector, is the gender diversity. Um, so I'm actually only one of two women on my site of 500 people. Um, so it is quite a daily struggle. Um, being one of the only women. Um, it can be pretty hard to get my voice heard sometimes and I, I'd be lying to say it wasn't a massive, massive challenge. Um, but I also absolutely love it because it's really diverse in other ways. So we have people from all over the world who come and bring their expertise on these projects. Um, working from anyone from, I think in the top right hand photos, there's a few of our directors who I have quite daily discussions with. Um, because I'm on site delivering the work down to sort of the guys who actually have shovels in their hands and they're doing the work and they're from all over the world and 
um yeah I think it, I think that's probably one of my favorite parts is we all bring our own expertise in different ways in construction not everyone's a civil engineer we've got mechanical engineers we've got environment specialists we've got people who plan it's a huge 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 team effort and for me a civil engineer's job on a construction site is kind of bringing it all together um and I'm a big organizer I love yeah I think I, I could have gone and done anything that needed some sort of planning and coordination and working with people it, it's really exciting um so if you just go to the next slide please so I think this photo just kind of again shows the scale of kind of what we've recently done especially if you can imagine beforehand it was just a grassy field um and it kind of shows the scale of how many people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis as well so it's been a really interesting job um kind of again working with such a variety of different people we're under a lot of time pressure to get the work done but you would literally see the site change every single day so no day is the same whatsoever and I love being on my feet and going out and solving problems and boy there were a lot of problems on this project but it has been really satisfying to see it through um so I think just sort of to finish off I think um the last five years of my career have been really challenging um I've kind of gone through chartership which is kind of collecting and developing your professional experience to show you're a completely competent engineer and sort of running quite a significant section of that job managing a team um I guess moving to London it was all quite a lot in five years um so I've actually decided to take a bit of a step away from uh engineering and work at the moment so I'm actually flying to South America tomorrow for a six month break um so I think um even though engineering can be quite demanding there are opportunities to take breaks and step away from it as well and I think particularly because of the nature of project work there's a lot of natural periods where things are busier and things are quieter so my, my roles kind of naturally come to an end now so I either would have been moved on to a new project or I could have decided to do something slightly different so I've just decided to take a bit of a time out to explore other interests but I'll be looking forward to going back to engineering once I've ever had a bit of sleep I think <laughs> so that's it um yeah and I'll pass back to Sarah thank you Gosh, that was fascinating. Thank you so much, Holly. And I'm particularly fascinated. I have family and friends are from London, so I go up and down on that line all the time and can see the changes that are happening um, and the HS2 signs everywhere. And I'm fascinated here that it's seven boroughs that you are tunnelling through. That's a lot of boroughs and all the underground stuff in London as well um, that, and, and elsewhere in the country. So I think and also that project HS2 is something that touches everybody in one way or another. We hear about it, you know, the cost of it. The impact it's going to have on people's lives and all of those things so it's really fascinating i can imagine to be involved in such a huge project and when you mentioned you are one of only two women in a team of 500 people a bit of a sharp intake of breath and then that panning photograph you had with all of those orange suits and i thought gosh there's you and then all of those orange suited men which is you know fine but it really does bring into stark light that there is still a long way to go i think in terms of equality in this particular field of study so it's brilliant that we're doing this event tonight and that we have three fantastic women who are all really successful at different stages of their career in this area so hopefully that's motivating to people watching of any gender of course any whoever you are um so thank you so much um Yvonne and you know from all of us you know you're you'll be here to take your questions should they come at the end but we're all a tiny bit jealous that you're going off somewhere for six months and and sounds like you're gonna have a very well deserved um break and um, hopefully hs2 will carry on whilst you're not there it won't all grind to a halt um so i'd like to now introduce our final um speaker um dr barton who's currently a consultant at um on international natural gas projects which um is obviously something that's really quite topical at the moment so thank you very much for joining us yvonne i'm now going to hand over to you and um uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming this evening. Well, th thank you very much for the introduction and good evening to everybody. And uh, what a privilege to be able to witness the launch of these fantastic careers. I I'm, I'm so impressed. Um, 
what I'm trying to do now is just give you a sort of a fast forward by 40 years as to what it looks like from the other end of a career. And I think um, my message to you this evening is going to be you don't know what that's going to hold. Um, a career in any profession will offer you a, a great range of opportunity, especially coming from a school like Manchester High, when, where you've had such a, a wonderful, diverse, rounded education. And but more so if you studied a subject like engineering, which is the key to doing so many things in life, um, the world's your oyster. So if I can just move into the first slide, please. Here we are. OK, um, just to start off, then um, I'm going to be looking at um, what I do from through the lens of energy, energy supply, uh, because it's such a topical thing today. And, and I think you, everybody's being scared witless about the idea of the um, lights are going to be switched off any moment. So I think it's pretty topical for many of us here. And the first thing I just want to ask you to think about is in this picture and I have to apologise now, my slide pack is nothing like as slick as the two you've just seen, so please forgive me, it's a bit homemade. Um, this photograph here is a process train for liquefied natural gas, and it's in Qatar. And what it's doing is it's taking um, gas that's come out of a reservoir underground, methane mostly, and uh, compressing it and chilling it, uh, down to the point where it becomes a liquid. So we can then pop it into a container, in this case, a, a ship, and bring it around the world to where it's needed, like here now. And that picture you can see there on the screen represents at least a billion dollars worth of investment, just that one process train, possibly two billion in today's market, actually. So I'll be coming back to that, but just to sort of keep that in mind, because throughout the two presentations you just heard, nobody's talked about the cost of things, how much of these projects are worth. And I think this is something that, that engineering and particularly civil engineering construction really excels at its big numbers. I mean, you know, billion here, billion there, pretty soon you're talking, well, a project. Um, so I also would like to point out that I've got, um, uh, like Holly, I am a chartered engineer and it's awfully important this and I'm delighted to know that Holly got so much support from the Institution of Civil Engineers. Um, I went on and, and converted my membership of the Institute into becoming a fellow and that was by showing leadership and distinction in the profession and after that I've also gone on and been elected to the Royal Academy of Engineering and what this means is that I'm able to participate in the sphere of influence of the engineering profession with politics and decision making uh, for the country. Uh, and at, at a very, at both at a strategic level, we get consulted, but also at a, at a human level. Uh, I, I personally vet applicants who want um, to come to the to the United Kingdom as uh, experts and researchers um, for their um, uh, visas to their, their permits to, to live in the country. Um, so, you know, we, we, we are very much ingrained in the whole fabric of decision making and, and, and government, which is which is a wonderful opportunity. OK, well, let's go back to where I started at Manchester High. If we go to the next slide, please. There we go. Now, when I was um, at school, um, I was quite good at maths and physics and chemistry. And, uh, and I was very lucky to be able to do those subjects because an awful lot of girls schools in those days didn't offer those subjects. And also it's very much the case that a, an all girls school makes it a lot easier to choose hard sciences. You know, if, if, if you're in a mixed school where the boys are going to do maths and physics and, and it's for them and not you, you might think, oh, well, now I'm going to do, you know, English instead. No, it's it's so good. It's, uh, the, the school gives uh, a completely un, um, unbiased, uninfluenced opportunity to do whatever your particular talents take you towards. Um, and I would just mention at this particular stage that I was absolutely hopeless at foreign languages. I mean, terrible in that they wouldn't even let me sit the O level in another subject. It, I, it, it was it was it was a, a nightmare for me. I don't know why I was so bad, because um, 
I can just fast forward 40 years and I actually live and work in a foreign language. <laughs> You know, one of the things I do is on a regular basis is read legal contracts and interpret them um, in Italian. And when you if, if my my French teacher could have seen this, I don't know what she'd say now. <laughs> um, I gave the poor, poor lady um, almost a heart attack when I was trying to learn the language. Anyway, what I really wanted to do when I was at school was go into um, theatrical costume design. That's what I really wanted to do. I was good at painting. I was very, very good at uh, making clothes. My mother was a, a textile designer. My aunt was taught uh, tailoring and, and, and dress. And then um, my father died and uh, I was in the fifth form. And it suddenly came home to me with a terrible shock that I was on my own in terms of my future earning potential. And my mother, when she'd been at art school um, many years before in at the Manchester Art uh, School, um, was the only person in her class to actually get a job. Oh, you know, granted, it was a difficult time, but nonetheless, it was very clear to us that I had to do something which would give me a uh, a career path that I could follow and get a a, a, a reliable income. And one that didn't require an awful lot of investment, like, you know, going to be a barrister, you have to have a lot of, you know, it's certainly there, and I think it's still to the case today, you need a private income to get started. And I couldn't contemplate something like that at all. Well, we didn't have the resources. The good thing, of course, in the old days was that university was free. And if you were not very well off, you got a grant as well for your um, everyday support. Uh, I think that's all a distant memory now, unfortunately, but there we are. So I was terribly lucky. I, I got a full grant and fees are all taken care of. Um, what to go and study? OK, well, quite a few members of my family were involved in the water industry. Uh, my father worked for uh, when he was alive, worked for Manchester Corporation Water um, Company. My uh, much older brother was a, a hydrologist. Um, my uncle was involved in the same sort of things. So it, it came to me quite early on that the um, provision of uh, sufficient and uh, clean water supply is the civilizing um, resource in this world. If you don't have enough water that is clean and safe to drink in sufficient quantities, not just to, to drink, but also to wash in, to keep clean. That's the only way you can avoid, um, that you can have a society which is free of disease and lead a healthy life and for people to prosper. And I still believe this. I still believe that water provision is the most important thing that civil engineers can do. Uh, and public health engineering, it sounds very dreary, but in fact, it's fundamental to how we live. Um, so I went to the University of Birmingham because that's uh, where there was a particularly good school of um, hydro engineering. Um, and in fact, my brother had been there many, many years before. Uh, I'm delighted to say that they've got a, a brand new um, engineering school, which is just about to open, which I commend to you all. Uh, it's a great campus. It's, um, it, it's alongside a, a, a terrific city and benefits from the um, uh, industrial past of the Midlands. Um, but it's, it, it gives a very good living environment and a very safe one. And there's a lot of uh, halls for residents and so on. So um, if you're uh, at all nervous about going away from home, then this campus university is a very good choice. But any of the Russell Group uh, of universities, of which Bristol is one, Imperial um, uh, and so on, Sheffield, Edinburgh, they uh, they all got a, a very strong tradition in, in, in industry and um, offer extremely good courses in, in engineering. OK, so I did my civil engineering um, undergraduate course there. And um, whilst I was there, there was a world economic crisis. And suddenly building big water schemes stopped being quite so popular. And it became obvious to me that water wasn't going to offer me any jobs. There was no there were no openings at all. As it was, I got started by that stage to get quite interested in, uh, and this met with, will sound terribly dreary, um, but geotechnical engineering, which is essentially the science of what 
a building stands up on or how you make a dam uh, hold back a reservoir of water or um, what stops things falling over basically and it's all buried underneath the ground and and it's it's rather fascinating because it's so fundamental and it's but it's very difficult to to notice what's going on there and, and very hard to research and in fact with geotechnical engineers we say that we're rather like doctors we bury our mistakes and i can assure you that <laughs> Um, the um, um, unforeseen ground conditions are responsible for more uh, failures of structural designs than almost anything uh, in, in the construction business. Uh, it really is an important area. Now, I went to Birmingham because it has a good water school, but the other reason I went to Birmingham was because the school with uh, Manchester High didn't understand in those days very much about engineering, how things have changed for the better. and. When I said, well, what about Oxford or Cambridge? They said, oh, good heavens, no. I mean, you'd never get in. I mean, it's far too difficult. You couldn't, why don't you go and do maths or something like that there? Now, if we can go on to the next slide, um, I actually did go to Cambridge and I went postgraduate. And when I got to Trinity College, it was fairly obvious that the one of the main, main old boys there was Sir Isaac Newton, who'd invented the whole uh, sphere of, of mechanics that we use today to um, in our engineering work and I just thought my goodness um, the idea of me coming here to do uh, mathematics would have been just just beyond you know just unthinkable but actually they were they had been looking for engineers and and it would have been relatively straightforward to get in I think nowadays though I think it, engineering is, is as challenging to get into at Oxbridge as as any other subject but at that time um, Maybe I could have done it, maybe not, but Birmingham was a jolly good grounding um, and they um, got me very well prepared to do a, um, a master's. It was a taught master's course and then a research degree, a PhD. And what I did there was started to work on um, the idea of the foundations of structures and not just static ones with just a building standing solidly on the ground but what happens when there is a, a, a lateral force a wave breaks over the structure uh, um, an earthquake something that makes it move in such and how does that how does the structure respond how does the soil respond um, and it's quite complex it's a, a very much a non-linear uh, um, inelastic medium which and to study this, um, Cambridge actually has a, it doesn't look very much on this picture, but it has a, it's um, an, um, a, a means of building a, a model of the stresses and strains in a structure under um, a, a centrifugal force that, that makes it as if the structure was many, many, many times more, more heavy. You, you, you make the gravitational force uh, more intense. So therefore, it's as if you're dealing with a big structure instead of just a little model. Um, and that's what I did my PhD with. Um, and it was all about waves and um, resistance of structures to wave loading. So now you're wondering, well, what's that got to do with where you come to now? Well, believe it or not, um, I'm that old that the, um, that the North Sea oil industry was only just about getting started. Now, if we go to the next picture, you'll see the first project I actually worked on. This is the Magnus oil field and the uh, oil industry was uh, starting to come to, to grips with um, exploiting the oil and gas resources in the North Sea. Um, this was a particular challenge because until then, an awful lot of the oil, oil that had been exploited in the world had been either onshore or in places offshore where the water wasn't so deep, such as the Gulf of Mexico or um, the shallow areas of the Caspian Sea. And uh, here in, in the North Sea, we we're, we're um, um, faced with the challenge not only of very much deeper water, but also of weather conditions, which are incredibly challenging. The, um, uh, the, the, the battering of, of, of waves on, on the uh, oil and gas platforms uh, in the middle of winter, or in fact, almost any day of the year, um, uh, imposes um, a load on the structure that is very difficult to design for, or at least it was then. 
And uh, the picture on the top, on the left there, I'm showing you because it's a very it, well. A, um, at BP, we used to say this is the only picture anyone's ever seen or taken of the, of, of a flat calm <laughs> out of Magnus. It's normally with waves breaking right over the whole platform. Now that platform, it's it's um, about 100 miles north of Shetland, and it's in 370 meters of water, which was the most northerly and the deepest platform which had ever been built at that time. And today it's nothing. I mean, you know, a thousand meters, you know, uh, west of Shetland, hundreds of miles north, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. The structure that we worked on, which you can see there on the right hand side, um, it, um, it, it, it's floating out on its own, own legs. It, it's a self buoyant platform and they, they had to tow it all the way out into the middle of the, uh, of the sea there. And it was then pinned to the seabed using um, very long steel tubulars, um, which, which fix it to the seabed. Um, th this was the cutting edge then. That platform is still there you'll be pleased to know. And it's just in its last throws. So the, 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 they're getting the last bits out of the, the reservoir. So the, 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 it, it, it essentially it represents the, you know, the, um, the story of the um, offshore oil, oil industry in the UK. Um, um, I got chartered uh, at BP um, working on not just projects like that, but also smaller ones like in uh, onshore oil fields building um, uh, smaller projects which would be in tune with the local environment, like down at Witch Farm in Dorset. Um, anyway, fast forward, um, if, if we can go to the next slide, I'll show you where I then went next. Um, after a bit, I started to feel that um, whilst it was all very nice in the engineering construction side, I wanted to get a little bit closer to what they call the drill bit. Um, so here's the sort of thing you do here, which is uh, as a petroleum reservoir engineer, we um, look at the way the oil and gas flows through the rocks underneath the surface in a, in a reservoir. And uh, we use numerical models to do that. Um, the, the work we did in those days was considered um, world leading in terms of the type of computing we, we were using. Nowadays, it would be considered something you, you could do on a mobile phone. You know, it's, it's, it's gone on so far. But suffice it to say, the important message here is the same analysis of stresses and strains and um, the flows of the um, uh, um, of, of the stresses and strains that in a, in a structure in the substrata is exactly the same, more or less, as what we use to model oil and gas flows and in, in the reservoir. And this allows us to this, well, it, it meant that I could look at um, aspects of the petroleum industry, uh, which went just a bit further into the, the, the heart of how the industry does its business. And um, um, I, I then moved on to another company which was uh, making um, uh, new strides in, in the industry at that time, which was British Gas. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you what happened next. Um, uh, because I had developed an, an understanding of, of, shall we say, a very large part of the uh, industry, not just the, uh, you know, how you build the, the projects, how you manage the, the production of the oil and gas, and many, many other things which I then developed in, in my next company, I ended up as, well, I was always, whilst there, the most senior female employee in the company. And I ended up at uh, what more or less board level. Um, and uh, I was at one stage uh, vice president uh, in based out in Singapore, which I was in charge of all the operations and activities and projects in all of East Asia. And then I came back to Europe and I was made um, again, it's a vice presidential role, but it was uh, president of the Italian um, operations. And that included a lot of uh, work across the Mediterranean, too. Now, I'm not going to take you through any more of my career in detail because it's, you know, you've got a flavour of it already and you know what the industry is all about. So what I just want to say to you now is to give you a, an idea of the scale of opportunity this can present. When I was thinking about this, I thought, well, hang on, where have I been during this time that I wouldn't have gone on holiday? You know, just 
you know, let's let's forget, you know, Spain, Italy, France, places like that. Where have I been through my job that I couldn't have imagined going any other for any other reason? And I put all those on this map and I think I've been to 47 countries for work. I mean, that's an awful lot, isn't it? Um, and please, I mean, some of them are, are quite unusual, like South Korea and um, Jamaica and uh, Uganda, um, oh, the list goes on. Um, I've also put on there in uh, little circles that places where I've done project work for those countries, but not actually been to them. So I've not been to Myanmar, for example, and I've not been to Libya, uh, and I would clearly have loved to go to both, actually. But, you know, the world is your oyster. And, you know, uh, and this is another reason why being chartered is so helpful, because your, your qualifications are recognised across all these countries. Um, so just imagine that and all those places you could go. Gosh, um, there's a little bit on the west hand side of the uh, of, of Latin America. I've not done, but apart from that, <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. Anyway, if, if I could just move on very quickly, I just want to give you a flavour of what it is I actually do now. Um, liquefied natural gas, as you saw in that first slide, um, it's a, a very, very large scale industry. The um, product from that picture on the first slide will be put into a, a boat and you can see on the left hand side there, there is a uh, aerial picture of a, of a receiving terminal in, in Wales. Now that, that terminal can receive as much gas as would supply, provide um, about 25% of Britain's requirement in a year. And the the, um, the gas can come from, well, anywhere in a boat. Um, it was built by Exxon and uh, the Qataris. Uh, so a lot of the shipments there come from Qatar. And you can see the ship on the end of the jetty. Uh, that ship, it doesn't look very much maybe, but um, it is 350 metres long, which is about four hockey pitches length. Um, it, that ship will have cost somewhere around 250, 300 million dollars. The terminal, the, the, the construction that's on that picture, you know, with the storage, these are storage tanks you can see on the uh, in the foreground. Each one of those contains about 200,000 cubic meters of liquid. And um, so it can, uh, anyway, but that picture, uh, all that equipment kit, whatever, um, is worth about a billion dollars. Um, now, that's a very, very large project. And there's another one very similar on in the south of England uh, in, at the mouth of the Thames on uh, the Isle of Grain. So uh, if you were to add up those two, plus there's another smaller project just around the corner from this one, uh, plus the production from the North Sea that we have in the UK, that just about covers Britain's net annual requirements for gas. So all of this talk about, oh, well, you know, we're going to run out and, and uh, we're going to be switched off. Um, we're doing our best, you know, we really are. You know, if, if we do run out, it won't be because of these guys. Now, um, a project that I personally worked on is in Lithuania, and that's in the in the top right hand picture there. On the right, it's a floating version of all that equipment you can see on the left. Essentially, it's a floating storage unit. And the red ship on the left has come from Norway with liquefied natural gas and it's transferring it across. And the reason we did this and we did it incredibly quickly is because the Russians were threatening. And this is six years ago. The Russians are already threatening to switch the gas off. And indeed, they now have. And in fact, when, when we were there most recently, um, there was a, a team from NATO talking about their, uh, this as a, a very important component of the resilience of the of Lithuanian and the Baltic nations. Um, to give you an idea of scale, on the, the rim of the, on the edge of the boat on the left, there are people. And if you look at the bottom picture, you will see a close up of these people and you see the size of these ships. Uh, and that one on the left there, that red one, is not is nothing like as big as the one that's in the left hand picture. It's a, it's a, a much older, smaller version. So you see the scale. And so, you know, 
billion here, billion there. But that's that's what it takes for for you know energy security. Um, and this project in Lithuania is connected through nowadays to by pipeline to Latvia, Estonia, and Poland. And recently, Poland has been exporting gas to Germany because the Germans have not installed any of these floating terminals. So, um, OK, if we just go just one last slide um, and I'll I'll um, I'll give up this. Um, excuse this. This is a hand drawn map. Um, this shows you where um, liquefied natural gas comes from to uh, in, to the UK. Um, uh, there's the Qataris I've talked about. But there are also quite important developments of, uh, of, of natural gas that come to us by ship from Africa, uh, North Africa and West Africa. And nowadays, massive amounts coming from uh, new projects in, in the United States. And, and this is this is us turning uh, engineers, turning to face the rest of the world to bring you energy security. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry, I was actually just looking. I've got slides down here and I was really studying these, uh, the map and things and just thinking about what you were saying in the in the latter part of your presentation there about that nexus and the relationship very much between politics and particularly the work that you are clearly very heavily involved in. And we can quite see how it becomes all aspects of what the engineers have been talking about is really significant for you know society and development, economics employment, productivity, the environment and all of those things. And you can quite see when you're dealing with these global international um, infrastructure systems, how challenging it is. Um, and particularly now with critical situations and also with the, you know, the harsh, the harsh reality of, of, you know, the situation with the climate and how we've all got to contend with making sure that no further damage is done. So it's a very, very challenging and complex situation. But I think you, you know, presented and communicated that in a really, a really lovely, clear way, um, saying that we do have enough gas and the lights aren't going to be turned off. And I remember because I am of the age when there was a time a few decades ago when the lights were turned off and it was OK because we had candles and open fires and we survived. Um, but yes, thank you so much. It was really, really fascinating. And also to hear um about you being you know one of the only women at the time when you were starting out i'd be interested to know how many women there are who are vps um and pe women people at your level in the engineering profession at the moment um so before we perhaps do have a couple of questions at the end um I'm just going to talk a little bit now, and all all of our speakers have touched upon this about routes into engineering. We've we've heard how all of our guest speakers got into the into the engineering, um, perhaps the reasons why they did it, and what courses were available. Um, and I think that it's a very very popular course. Um, it certainly is a very very popular course. Increasingly, students are looking for something that combines an interest in um, well, geopolitics, really, um, climate, practical hands on solutions to things that perhaps involve some of the mathematical um, and almost data driven hands on project based work. So um, Ms. Hannon, our head of careers, who does a lot of work with students um, and helps advise students for university applications and so on, um, has actually assisted me by providing some slides that I'm going to just talk about. So if we could have our first our first slide. So um, what Miss Hannah always does really beautifully at this point in these um, events is brings it down to the sort of nuts and bolts of where you would be now or in a, a year or two's time, um, students and young people watching. So she likes to pull together a couple of different things and she has brought out here, so um, Sheffield University. Now, the way to engineering, we'll talk about apprenticeships in a moment, but yes, um, if you go the traditional degree route, you can essentially do a bachelor's, which is a three year degree, or you can do a master's, which is a four year degree. You can also do either one of those degrees with a year in industry, if that's the nature of the course. So when you're looking for courses, it will say whether it's got a year in industry opportunity or not, possibly doing a year abroad. Um, if you do the master's degree, you do need to do further training to become qualified. If you do the uh, sorry, if you do the bachelor's, you need to do further training. If you do the master's degree, you still need to do further work to become a chartered engineer. 
um, that you've got that little extra bit that en enables you to graduate and start working. Um, so, for example, Ebony's degree is five years because she's done the master's degree, but she's also done a year in industry, which is how she ended up getting a job, because I think that I'm right that the place that she now works is where she did her placement year. Um, so that's um, those those are basically the two sort of degree routes in. So all of the universities in the UK or the majority of the universities in the UK and indeed abroad will offer engineering courses um, of one sort or another. We know that there are chemical engineering, civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, aerospace engineering, um, and there are probably even more specific engineering. So perhaps medical engineering, all sorts of different engineering that you can get involved in. So you would just really need to look at the, the name of the course and the content of the course. Most engineering courses, whether it's the master's or the bachelor's, will have a sort of generic first year of basic and basic kind of introductory modules that are core to all engineering. And then you will perhaps specialise. And we heard, I think, um, Ebony saying that um, she'd chosen a mechanical route, but when she did the civil modules, I think really enjoyed the civil modules. Um, so there are lots of you can choose what you want to specialise in. So this is a typical sort of Russell Group University um, in, in the heart of the UK, or the heart of the north of the UK, not so far perhaps from Birmingham, um, where um, Yvonne studied um, a little bit further than from Bristol, where other two speakers studied. Um, it's a very popular and very successful um, engineering degree. I should say at this point, I didn't know Miss Hannah was going to use Sheffield as an example. My son is doing an engineering degree at Sheffield at the moment, which he's enjoying greatly. Um, and it has a reputation as one of the best engineering departments, but all of the engineering departments will have a huge amount of strength um, to them. So you just need to look, um, you just need to go to the open days and look at the detail. One of the things that I know that um, Sheffield does have a very good um, reputation for is its links to industry because where it is in the old kind of manufacturing area of the country it has a lot of, it prides itself on having the most work experience or work placement opportunities available to students, whether that's factually true or not, but that's certainly what they say on their open date information, so you'd hope it would be true. Um, so um, typical offer at um, um, a Russell Group or at Sheffield University is ranges from A star AA to three A's. Occasionally there may be an AAB offer and this is in the A levels that you would need to get. Um, things are a little bit more competitive at the moment at university generally because there is a larger number of 18 year olds moving into the university sector over the next few years. Um, and you know, engineering is an incredibly popular course. So um, in terms of entry requirements for degrees in engineering, maths and physics are almost always prerequisites but you would need to check there may be it may be it, there may be some flexibility there. Some universities, I know that Sheffield does this as well, do foundation courses so that if you have not got the right A levels or not maybe not the right grades, um, you can um, choose to do the degree that you choose to go on with a foundation year, which will sort of get you up to speed. And those are increasingly coming on. I'm seeing with all the work that I do with UCAS, many, many universities are now offering foundation degrees in lots of different subjects, not just engineering, in order to bolster um, and attract a wider range of students than might otherwise maybe be attracted to those courses, perhaps because they didn't necessarily choose the right A-levels when they were choosing their A-levels or indeed because their education has been impacted by what we know has gone on for the last few years. So it's worth looking out for that as well. So even if you think you've not quite got the right courses or perhaps got the right grades, many universities, including Sheffield, do a foundation course will take you onto the engineering course. Um, so, so engineering degrees, there's a lot of project work, so they normally have lovely buildings. We heard about the Birmingham, the new engineering centre um, or the um, building at Birmingham. Um, they all have lovely facilities because they're very project based, hands on practical degree as well as the academic work that you have to do. A lot of group work, a lot of project work, um, using machinery, using technology, experiments, lab work, that sort of thing. So if you like that kind of thing, it's a really um, interesting degree. So this is that's just one example of, um, of, a, of, a, of an engineering course. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, degree apprenticeships, which have been mentioned a bit like the foundation years I was mentioning, degree apprenticeships, which have been around for quite some time, are growing in number and again employers as we've heard um, find these are very valuable as students who've done apprenticeship degrees are very valuable so the way that these work are you can do apprenticeships which aren't which don't get you a degree they are as, um, training and education in a particular field and you go on to get a job 
A degree apprenticeship is where you, you have a, a work placement, um, you go to work, you earn a salary, but you are also getting a degree at the same time. And so the uh, the apprenticeships are run by the manu by the business or the company that you're working for. The degree, the education side of it is run by a college or a university and the two go hand in hand. A typical degree, as we've heard, is three or four years, maybe five if you go abroad or do a year in industry. With a degree apprenticeship, because you are working usually four days a week um, and having a day out a week to do your degree, they can take longer because it takes you longer to do that degree work because you're working at the same time. However, the benefits are that you are working immediately, you're learning, you're training on the job, you're very, very attractive to employers in the future. You are having your fees paid for university. You do not pay any fees, the employee will pay the fees and you will be getting a salary, usually around £20,000 for an engineering degree apprenticeship. So there are many, many benefits to this. And if you're somebody who wants to get straight into work, who doesn't want to compartmentalise academic learning in a very focused period of time, and then go out and get a job and you want to merge the two together, a degree apprenticeship would be a route for you to go. Um, there are many, many upsides, there are many positives and many benefits. It is a different experience though. Um, you don't necessarily have that traditional university experience that, that your friends might be having. You're not going out and, you know, I'm sure students all work very hard, but you're not partying four nights a week. Um, you are having to be much more disciplined because you've got to get up and go to work. Um, and you may not be in the same lectures as your friends, because although they're doing the same degree, you're learning in one day what they're learning in five days, albeit in a more compressed fashion and over a longer period of time. So it's a slightly different setup. However, they are very, very competitive. It's not the easy route. They are very, very competitive because you are get, you are applying for a job. So when you apply to a degree, appren degree apprenticeship, you actually apply for the job. If you get the job, you are then on the course as long as you have the requirements which are usually lower than are required for a, a traditional academic degree because you're also working at the same time if the employer feels that you're capable of doing the job the degree will go hand in hand about the placement on the degree it can be harder to find than university courses or just straight jobs because the two are merging together the UCAS website does have an, a degree apprenticeship area you can also look simply at companies, Rolls-Royce, Jaguar, BAE Systems, lots of different companies will simply say we have apprenticeship degrees. On university websites, increasingly they will just advertise alongside all of their degree programmes, the apprenticeship degrees, and many of the mainstream universities you will have heard of do offer degree apprenticeships in other areas, not just engineering, but engineering is a very much, is a very strong area for degree apprenticeships. For example, in this area, in, in our area here, BAE Systems has um, an aerospace engineering degree apprenticeship. It takes between five and six years to complete. Um, you have placements and different specialisms. Um, you are based in the Lancashire area. There was some travel that you need to do along with that. They are particularly targeting wanting to recruit more women into engineering. So they have a target of 50% women on their degree apprenticeship programmes. Um, and indeed into their company, which is a very, very big, um, a very tall order, but they are very keen to recruit more women into their programmes. You get your fees paid and you get £20,000 a year. Um, you can also go on the government website, just so UK Government Apprenticeships Engineering and a whole list of things will come up and you can filter by all sorts of different things. Um, so degree apprenticeships are definitely something to look at. Um, and I know that for some people who are maybe a little bit older, they may hear the word apprenticeship and think, oh, that's not that's not perhaps what what I was thinking that my child would do. But it's quite it's a different thing now. Um, these are very competitive and very highly rated um, programs um, and they they don't take in very many students. So it's definitely worth looking at. OK, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is just um, the idea about you need to just do a little bit of research into engineering. But if you've listened to this speech, this speech tonight, you will have heard a whole range of, of information about what engineering is. Um, you can read all about it on university websites, on the UCAS website. You can um, there is lots of information out there in all sorts of different places to find out about engineering and what might what might be of interest to you. And engineering is everywhere around us. It's not just necessarily wearing a hard hat or being on an oil rig or designing where you're going to put your human waste pipe in a building so that it doesn't um, affect the sort of, in, you know, the nice facade of a building. There are all sorts of other things that engineers do. Um, engineers design most of the things that we use in practical day-to-day -day life. 
Um, they also design things in laboratories, medical engineering, um, engineering to do with, with sort of science and medical equipment and transport and vehicles. There are so much. Um, there's also things like soft furnishings, um, interior design of spaces, working with architects. There's a lot of engineering work that goes into these things as well. So lots of different areas in which engineering is useful. And there was one question that I just wanted to ask um, all of the engineers, really, um, which uh, if we just come to, to our speakers in the order in which you spoke just before we round up. So if we start with Ebony, um, my question really is, if you study a particular kind of engineering, do you have to stay with that? So, for example, Ebony, you're very much just starting out, but Holly, if you, when you come back into your role and think, I don't want to do civil engineering anymore, I would actually like to do some mechanical or electrical engineering. Is that possible? Or once you're in a in a trajectory, do you need to stay in that trajectory? If I just ask Ebony first. Um, I think that's a really good question and one that I definitely contemplated a lot when I was deciding which stream to go down. I think it um, probably from my limited experience, I'd say it depends on the the sector that you're in. So where I'm in, in building services, I'm working with a team of lots of different types of engineers, electrical, public health, structural. So I'm naturally going to get a lot of their knowledge. So I'm, I'm a bit more varied, not so much streamlined, which is something that I I preferred um, and also get into some architectural knowledge as well. Um, and I, I sort of pushed for that when I did my placement that I wanted to go into the different departments and learn. So there's there's opportunity for that depending on what sector you're in. I think if you if you'd have done uh, aerospace, for example, and you had a lot of experience on designing a jet engine, it might be a bit difficult to then transfer to something less um, niche but if you if you're broad then you can the the skills are very transferable so i'd say you're not limited but that's just from what i understand so far yeah i would probably echo that as well actually i think it's there's probably opportunities to move around, but as I suppose as you get more specialised in your career, for, for example, I'm, I'm quite a generalised civil engineer, I'd say, but I mainly work in construction. So my design skills, for example, are a bit rusty now. I don't think it means I couldn't transfer. It just means it, it, I'd probably have to get a bit more experience in, in doing that kind of thing as well. Sorry, Sorry do, Thank I, you, do yes. I get to... Yes, I, I'll just hand over to you, Yvonne, and then you can um, respond to that question. So I'm just going to hand over to Yvonne, who will just give you her, her view on that question. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I would just want to, to say that, that um, if you're chartered in a particular aspect of engineering, such as structural engineering, that in, in allows you to take full um, professional responsibility. So, for example, if you're designing a, um, an oil refinery or a, a particular structure or whatever, then, then you will need to have the qualifications that permit you to do that in your segment. So I, I, I personally could not go and do um, you know, aircraft design. At least you'll be very pleased when you get next get on a plane I, that I didn't do the design of your aircraft. And and, that, and that's for a very practical reason. You do need certain knowledge. It doesn't mean, though, that you can't go and learn how to do those things. You know, you, you, you can transfer, but you you would probably have to retrain in certain areas. But that can be fun. That could be a really, really you know, um, enriching thing to do. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, that kind of it's, it's very logical. Actually, it makes a lot of sense. You've got the practical specialism, you've got the qualifications and you've got the experience. And so it all leads for you to to stay within a particular area. But also there is opportunity to branch out should you want to and learn new skills. Or as Ebony said, if you're in a broader area, you you can learn different things from the different aspects. 
of the work that you do. That's really been really, really fascinating and interesting. And I've really enjoyed um, hearing from all of our speakers tonight who have very kindly given up their time to share their experiences and advice to our listening audience um, who are in the position you're in now, but in a few years time or maybe a few more years time, you might be in the position that our speakers tonight are in. So thank you so much, all of you. It's been absolutely fascinating and, and wonderful for, to hear your stories. Um, and it's also very um, enlightening and inspirational to think that there is such a world out there of things that opportunities that our young people can take up should they want to um, in the future. So thank you again and to our speakers. And thank you to Ellie behind the scenes who's been organising the technology despite our best efforts to not always make it work right. And also thank you to our audience for listening and being with us tonight. And please do make sure that you sign up for our future Insight Into events. Um, the next one being Insight Into Heritage and the Arts, which is coming up on November the 3rd. But information about that will be available soon. So good night to everybody. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>